Hi. So now let's um, briefly talk about the idea of having different strategies for doing variable and node selection. Those that are very important in the context of the branch about part of the branching cut. Um, so first looking into the notion of, of variable selection, which you might be, you know, sometimes you might see called as, as branching strategy. And it basically refers to what is the fractional variable X is selected uh, to then be branched and form subproblems. And uh, basically, there's a three main strategies that can be somehow combined. Um, so you can look into maximum feasibility. So if you think about the fractional part of your variable, you know, you, that if you have a variable that is 2.1 and a variable that is 3.5, 3.5 is more fractional than 2.1, so you pick that. So it's how far away it is from being either, you know, uh, it's round, it's lower C of I value or, or, or floor value. Um, this is sort of a, the obvious thing to do. And then, and then you have two more sophisticated ideas. One is called strong branching, um, and the other is called pseudo costs. And to be truly honest, most of modern solvers, what they do is some sort of some form of combination of these two, taking these into account as well. So here we are um, in our, just so we know where we are in our scheme for our uh, branching cut. Um, once again, this is also an area that is a lot of research going on, as you will see, especially when it comes to pseudo costs, because it involves a process of learning or can. Um, so that's kind of an interesting thing. And also there is a lot of ideas here that have been known in academia for, I wouldn't say a while, but are available that I have yet to be made um, uh, into professional implementations. Um, I, yeah, and this is also an interesting point is that most solvers allow you to do a user specified priority. So if you want to give, say, that, you know, you have an X variable that it's, you know that it's likely that once it's, it's fixed, it's set to a value, the problem becomes easier to solve. Um, location and location problems are a typical example. Then you can say that a variable has a higher priority when selected for branching. This is also possible to be done. Very user-specific and so on and so forth, problem-specific and all that, but most of the solvers out there allow you to do so. Right, so let's talk about strong branching. Strong branching is a very powerful idea. Um, and it basically relies on an explicit look ahead of everything you could do in terms of selecting variables for branching. So so basically it's, it's trying to look at all potential, what could be potential descendants for that node, test the waters and, and pick the one that is, you know, looking like it's going to give the best benefit. And what you're trying to do that is it's to improve what is the next LP relaxation bound you're going to get in, in, in the new generation of nodes. Um, so basically, in, in its most basic form, what you will do is for each fractional variable, you you solve the LPs for the corresponding branch options. And then you choose the one that would give you best bound, best dual bounds, and, and employ branching. So you have x1 and x2, both are fractional. You check what would happen if you branch it on x1, what would happen if you branch it on x2, and pick the one that looks best. You know, sounds like, a, at first, it sounds like it's, it's, you know, a bit of a lot of work, and it is, but it can be done efficiently. And, and it's underlying sort of standard method in any MIPS over array. Um, clearly, it's computationally intensive, so you have to be careful when you do so to, to make sure you're maximizing, you're even optimizing the use and reuse of, of information you're getting from your sub-problems. Um, and it's very effective in terms of reducing the number of nodes explored. Um, some some um, strong branching approaches, they might have slightly different names and what they're doing is um, 
what you're doing is basically limiting the number of simplex iterations that you you allow to do when you're testing for new branching directions. So instead of solving to optimality these these sub problems for each of the variables, what you do is just just do I don't know a hundred simplex iteration simplex iterations and then see what happens. And whatever you have, use that as a reference. Um, one advantage of strong branching is that by doing strong branching, because you're kind of solving all the potential uh, fractional variables, you you gather information, so uh, you can uh, you can use um, some sort of register where you find that you can use in your favor um, in terms of I don't know variables that can potentially be fixed or cuts that can lead to feasible infeasible solutions. So so you can use that information that you're gathering from the other variables uh, that you're pretending to to select for branching while doing strong branch and, and, and gather that information to be used um, with with a with a appropriate coordination scheme um, to make sure it's it's um, it's it's reused in terms of cutting or reducing the search tree. Um, so that's strong branching. And the other idea is the notion of pseudo costs. So the notion pseudo costs they they rely on on past branching observations. So then you can use to estimate uh, what would be objective gains when you consider the fractional part that is being lost when you set your branching uh, constraints. So basically, what we do is we do this sort of average estimated gain in the LP per fractional unit. So if you call this F minus and F plus, the, the difference between um, the rounded down version of the value from the F, the LP and F plus the rounded up version. And you combine this difference and you multiply by this average observed improvement in the LP per fraction of units observed. So basically, suppose in the past you made that variable, I don't know, it was 2.4, you made it lesser or equal than 2. And uh, when by doing that, when you look, so let me draw something so we can keep track of what I'm talking about. So suppose you found your XLP here was a variable with a component, and then it had this component 2.4, and then all the variables there, and then you decided that that's the variable you want to branch, say that this is lesser or equal than 2. And then when you solved this XLP, when you solved the XLP there, you found a, another solution, it doesn't matter, but then your ZLP was was a given value, I don't know, 10. And suppose that with this, when you solved, you actually had a value, I don't know, 11.5. Um, so let me move this a little bit because I can I realize I'm in front of it. Um, there you go. So that means that, you know, you saw an improvement of 1.5 for 0 0.4 variation. So if you keep track of how much your objective function is decreasing or increasing, depending on, in this case, decreasing, if you were, say, maximizing, um, and given this these fractions, you can start having this estimate, capital, I think that's a psi, um, that is giving you an average of, it's an estimate of how much your objective function will change, your dual bound you change, if you're changing that variable by this fractional amount. You can see that that's these, you know, there's a lot of questions that are, must be in your hand now as soon as we talk about that, and we'll, we'll come to them in a second. So basically then what you do, your pseudo cost is basically, you can try, you can estimate from the get go how, what is the benefit you're going to be getting by branching on that variable um, because you're using that estimate to you know how much it's going to decrease or increase your, your dual bound. Clearly, for that to work, you have to have information on that. And these averages, they are going to be completely off, the, off in the beginning when you want, you might have even branched it on the variable yet. So, And that's why, you know, strong branching in pseudo costs, they, they're kind of like complementary to some extent because that sort of information you could be keeping track when you're doing strong branching. So that's what I was saying, you know, you can somehow keep track of the information you're getting. And one important information you're getting from strong branching that you can use is exactly how these variables are affecting the dual bounds 
uh, when when the fractional uh, per per unit of fractional variation. And then you can anyway. Then you once you you have these deltas, what you can do is you can have a branching score. Um, and a branching score is basically a function that can be have different forms that you're trying to give a score of how good is likely that that branching that you're doing is going to be. So this is one possibility, kind of a famous one, where you have this multiplier alpha. And then basically, you know, you're, you're picking the J that has a combination of the minimum of the deltas or the maximum of the deltas. Um, so, so this is basically, you know, basically telling us whether if you if you you either look at the minimum values and you want to pick the minimum of the variations or you pick the maximum of the variations or something in between. And the reason why you would be you know sort of divided is that because this this poses a trade off. So if you um, sorry, this should be point by point. Sorry, there's a lot of stuff at the same time, but we'll, we'll go for it. So I'm here. So basically, when you set alpha to zero. So when you out out to zero, what you're doing is you're always speaking like the maximum maximum possible variation in your dual bound. So, and that means that you know um, you you do a phenomenon is that it, it slows down degradation uh, because uh, if you are you know if you're picking the maximum of these values, um, so in a maximization problem. It means that you are uh, you you're you're making your dual bound. Remember that if you're maximizing, your dual bound is going down, right? So if you're maximizing, um, let me let me do that picture. If it makes it easier to understand what's going on. So if you go if we're maximizing, uh, our primal bounds go like this, and our dual bounds go like that. So if you're making if you're picking the maximum of these things. If you're picking the maximum of these things, what you're basically doing, you are slowing down the process of making the bounds go down. And that means that you are, you're minimizing degradation in the solution. Uh, meaning that you, you're trying to sort of give you a chance to find, to, to not let this go down too fast. You're maximizing, trying to improve your chances of eventually finding good primal bounds. And, you know, you can also go in the direction of making alpha 1, then it's pushing all this way down, trying to find fast improving uh, dual bounds, LP bounds. So there is a trade-off then that you, then you have to consider. Um, some solvers like Express, this is the one I know for off, you can uh, have alternative branching score functions. You can set different branching score functions from a predefined collection. Um, so... Another obvious thing is that um, in the beginning of the process, when you haven't done an earth branching, um, these things are clearly not reliable, um, meaning that the information you have on those PCIs, it's rubbish. So, and that can lead to, to a lot of instability, right? So that's where um, combining a hybrid strategy that says you start relying more on strong branching and then later on using more pseudo costs is typically a, a more a winning strategy um you will see that for example cbc has a parameter that lets you control how much you trust pseudo costs uh, and of course because this is a learning approach there is a lot of can be done here um a lot of interesting things that that the ideas that have been emerging of whether you can use some sort of regression to kind of predict these um, um, uh, pseudo costs, and there is one thing that appears in some solvers is is, the, is this notion of reliability branching. Reliability branching is is just basically a way of saying how much you trust your pseudo costs. So you say something like you only trust pseudo costs if you visited the node a given time a number of times before. Otherwise, do strong branching. So this is the same idea that you know you can simply say that how much you trust your pseudo costs and that connects to the notion of reliability branching. CBC has this, for example. All right. Right. So this is um, in terms of branching. One thing I wanted to, to mention here, this is something uh, popped up in other in another class is this notion of gut branching. 
So gob branching is something that is, is specifically related with the notion of having binary variables with constraints like so. So these are called special ordered sets, but sometimes they're called generalized upper bounds as well. And the main thing is that whenever you have constraints like that, if you do your, your traditional branching, so say we start in here and then we say that x1 equals 0, you are, and then, you know, uh, well, it would be less or equal than 0 or x1 greater or equal than 1, but because x1 is binary, you would officially say, you know, technically saying x1 equals 0 and x1 equals 1. Um, equals one. So, so basically, what's happening with this is that you kind of like this is going to be a feasible solution because as soon as you say that x one is one, you're also saying that all the other x's is zero. So, so it's basically be pruned here. While this thing, because you're saying that this is zero, then then you have you know, in principle, this is going to keep going like so. So you have this very unbalanced tree that at the end looks like this and clearly this is not good you know you can think of, of a healthy healthy looking branch and bound tree tends to have be a bit more scattered and there is a reason why you want some um, breadth to it which is associated with something that is called ramp up which is basically the notion that as soon as you have more sub problems and they are distant enough, you can solve these and these in parallel because they, they become independent. There is a likely, more likelihood they are independent. But this, this doesn't allow ramp up at all. So it's a very inefficient sort of way of doing branching when you have these constraints. So when you say that, you know, you have constraints like so, you're telling your solver that for these variables, it might be a more better idea to do something that is called group branching or SOS branching. And uh, it typically goes like this. You you pick a, a index um, R where, um, so it's the first index that you see that is when you solve summing your binary variables that have all fractional values because you're solving the LP relaxation up to the point that they add to half. So, and then what you do is that you say that either uh, those, uh, um, either this half is zero or either the other half is zero. So basically, so suppose you have x1 equals 0 0.2, x2 equals 0 0.1, x3 equals 0 0.2. Uh, I have to make this add to one. x4 equals 450.3 and x5 equals, uh, that's fine, I think in 3, 5, 8, 0 0.2. There you go. So that will be feasible for that constraint, right? So instead of saying, well, branch on x1, make x1 0, and x1 1, because the branch I make x1 1, I'm also making all these 0. What I'm saying is that I'm going to have one branch where x, in this case, you see that adds to half here. So r would be, say, 3. Um, um, so basically what we'll have on this side is x1 equals x2 equals x3 equals 0. And then on the other branch, it would look like, uh, let me move that a little bit so I get more space. Um, it would look like x3 equals x5 equals 0. And that would be my other branch. So by doing that, I, I kind of lead, you know, I still have some freedom in both sides and therefore I can have a more balanced tree. All right. Great. So that's all in terms of good, uh, of branching. Now, in terms of node selection, um, basically then, then your strategies are trading off the following. Um, improving primal bounds, so you can do more pruning by bound. And that's that's a good thing. That's a great thing. Uh, also trying to improve the global dual bound. So you know that you know the global dual bound, you, you pick the worst of all the dual bounds you've seen because that's the only one that can be employed globally. Um, there is also, you know, we have to take into account computational effort. Um, so if you think, you know, this notion that once we solve a problem, then we add a constraint and we can call dual C plex and 
because because they are very similar, you can solve efficiently. Well, that means that you're creating kind of a prefer preference in terms of how you wanna generate uh, sub nodes to solve. Solving children nodes should be easier than solving sibling nodes in terms of similarity because a children node only has an additional constraint, while a sibling, you know, it doesn't have a constraint; it has another. So so it's it's different, and. And when you think about other nodes, you know, that are connected only by previous generations, then the, the, the difference, the dissimilarity between sub problems become much greater. So there is more computational effort involved in terms of going from one sub problem to another. Um, and that's kind of related with, you know, the amount of change you have to do with the starting base for the Wu simplex. And also, on the other hand, if you have these trees that are more uh, wide spread out, then, then you're increasing something that is called ramp up, meaning that you, you the this comes from the fact suppose that you have your processors each being a worker, and a ramping up means finding something for each of them to do. So as you start to give more work to your workers, your workers get more and more busy, and that means ramping up. Um, and the, in branch and bound, you know, in order to be use parallel workers, you have to make sure the sub problems are sufficiently independent because you can't really have dependency between them, dependencies between them, um, such as they depend on the results of each other and so on. So, um, and a way to, to build up uh, and ramp up is, is to have a wide tree where, where your, your, your nodes are very distant relatives. Um, and with those in mind, there's basically four main strategies, I would say. One of them is depth first, so you dive, you dive down in the search tree. But you know, um, some solvers like CBC, you have things like dive down and dive up. Di and down and up just means whether you rounding down or rounding up. So that's down and up. But what I mean, dive down, it means that um, when I look at my at my tree, um, and then whenever I have the option. So suppose I'm in this situation here, say that I solved this sub problem instead of that, then instead of coming and solving here, what I would do is I would, I don't know, pick one of those and open up and pick this and go that, pick that, something like that. So this will be an alternating, or if I'm always speaking now, I'm going this direction all the time and so on. Um, the reason why I wanted that is because I want to hit a leaf as soon as possible and as leaf being a feasible solution and hopefully I can backtrack and, and do some uh, pruning by bound. So having a feasible solution early is beneficial. Um, breadth first is the other way around. So it means that now I'm open my tree. I solve these two. Then I open and solve these. And then I open and solve you know, because then perhaps this node and this node, they are sufficiently sufficiently dissimilar that I can solve them in parallel. Maybe they these have, con I don't know, maybe this node has constraints on variables one and two, and maybe this only has constraints in variable 40 and 50, 40 and 41. So it means that I can send this to a sub processor and that to another processor and solve them in parallel. So yeah, it does. So this sub problem and this sub problem, they, they can be solved. In, I can't really get, say, um, suppose I open these two sub problems and then I open this. Um, well, this is this is a bit more confusing. So anyway, so so that I hope you get my argument here that by by having separate sub problems uh, further up on the tree, um, you can solve them in, in parallel. Um, so the notion of um, best bound is is basically you you choose the sub problem that has the best dual bound, um, uh, very very trivial, and the idea is that you're trying to find you know be able be able to prune by bound sooner than later. Um, so you're hoping that by picking the 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 parent with that you just solved has. Um, so, so by the way, it, this is a bit confusing sometimes when you say, you know, you, you, you pick the best bound, but how do you know best bound because you're selecting a sub problem to solve? This is referring to the bound of the parent. So, so um, hopefully by solving those children first, you'll 
you are quicker um, lifting the bound enough to be pruned to then cut that branching by by bound. Um, so that's what that means. You're looking at the the dual of of the parent node, uh, the dual value of the parent node to decide whether you can trim um, to select those children to then hopefully trim by bound. Um, but it this it's it's sort of scattered, right? So so you might be jumping around the tree. You might be picking. Um, again, you have suppose you have a tree that looks like that. Say at this moment, uh, and this is open like that, and I mean, and this is open like so, and and then you know you might pick this sub problem and solve, and then pick that sub problem and solve, and and that that causes a lot of overhead because these problems might be very different. Um, another idea is to um, use estimates um, in terms of node progression towards feasibility. This works very similar to the notion of pseudo costs, but now what you're trying to figure out is how much closer you are getting to a feasible solution or how much the fractional part of your solution is, is decreasing. And you can calculate that associated with... Um, associated with bound degradation, also using pseudo costs. Um, so for example, you can use um, one estimate that you can use is that let ZD be the local dual bound from the parent. And then what you can do is, is calculate uh, an estimate of um, a best primal feasible solution. It, it's, it, this thing is estimated the following. If you were to find a primal feasible solution there, that primal feasible solution would have a value that it look, looks like this, which is basically, you know, uh, moving. Um, so this is the fractional part you will have to remove to make it. Um, and that will be the improvement associated with that fraction. And that will be the part you have to remove if you're moving, rounding up, and that will be the improvement in that direction. And then, you know, you can be conservative and pick the worst. So that value would give you a, what would be estimated primal bound. And you can use that as a reference, hoping that you'll find there a, a best primal solution in terms of these estimates. Um, and uh, and also you, you can also change this to take into account feasibility probability. So it, it doesn't really matter if you, you know, looking at a primal, primal estimated primal value that looks good if that solution also can't be feasible. So you can kind of um, you can kind of make sure that this is that you can calculate a probability of feasibility, which is based on non-primal feasible solutions as well. So how likely it is to look like a, a primal feasible solution. So it's, it's just you know to give an idea of where these things come from. Of course, it's much more complicated than that, but just to make sure you at least know what it's about when you when you have, op have the option of selecting this. All right. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say about node selection. Uh, in the next and final video, we'll talk about uh, primal heuristics. So um, see you in the next video. Bye-bye.